Welcome to Libraries Today. This program is intended to recognize and highlight the unexpected ways local libraries serve their communities today. I'm your host, Stan Howe. For nearly 90 years, the West Virginia Library Commission has assisted, advised, and counseled public libraries in developing a culture that values reading, education, and freedom of access to information. It was created by the state legislature back in 1929. Originally located in Morgantown, the WVLC eventually moved to Charleston, where it was housed in a variety of buildings around the state capitol and in Kanawha City. The commission finally found a permanent home when the new State Culture Center opened its doors in 1976. Today we take a closer look at the WVLC, its history, the many ways it helped create the public library system that we know today, and how it still supports 171 public libraries in West Virginia. Let's first take a look at the history of the WVLC with commission member and historian, Dr. Charles Julian. Dr. Julian, thanks for being with us today. So tell me uh, about the beginning of library service in West Virginia. Library development in West Virginia was very slow in coming about. While many other libraries throughout the country were developing because of the economic conditions, the, the rural nature of the state, and also poor financing, we had libraries that were basically subscription libraries, first people in communities paying to use the library. Then ultimately, um, it, academies and other learned societies had libraries, and it wasn't probably until the mid 20th century that library development really took off, and that was the result of generally of federal funding. So for a long, long time, we did not have many public libraries in the state of West Virginia. How did the Library Commission fit into all of this? Well, the Library Commission was a critical piece because often around the country, funding was being funneled through library commissions. But for many, many years, starting in the late 1800s, governors proposed to the legislature the creation of a library commission, and it just never happened. Successive governors would make those recommendations. The legislature would never approve them. So finally, in 1929, the uh, bill was passed, and the library commission was created. But they didn't give them any money. So you had a, you had a library commission on paper for about a dozen years without any money. So it was very, very difficult to get anything done. And so those very first uh, early headquarters, uh, which uh, funding happened in 1941, were at West Virginia University in a small building that had previously uh, served as the Student Health Center, and it became the state headquarters for the Library Commission. It's amazing, really, to, uh, to have a commission and no money. Uh, who, who were some of the early builders of the commission, the early secretaries, the people who kind of got it going and had to work with that limited amount of funding? Well, very early, Gordon Bennett was our first uh, secretary. He was based out of Morgantown, and uh, he did not last very long. In about a year or so, he left. Then Claire Johnson was our second executive secretary of the Library Commission, serving essentially as the state librarian, and she only lasted a few years. But then Dora Ruth Parks was appointed as the uh, executive secretary, and Dora Ruth Parks lasted many, many years. <laughs> And she helped shepherd some of the federal money and lay the groundwork for many of the programs that Fred Glazer took on. And he was the great builder of many of the libraries in the state. In some of the early days, uh, many of the libraries uh, were started and founded by women's clubs. And if you kind of look through the history of individual libraries, you see it time and time again. Probably about a third of all of the public libraries were established by women's clubs or women's civic groups. And that was uh, for a lot of reasons. One, they were movers and shakers in their communities, and so they got things going. But also, the General Federation of Women's Clubs were instrumental in developing literary societies, libraries. And so, in this state, uh, the women's clubs helped to found the West Virginia Library Association. And both of them, the Library Association and then uh, the women's clubs, were advocates for the creation of the Library Commission. You, t you mentioned that it took a while for the funding to, to occur, 12 years or so. Uh, how did that change over the years? Funding started in 41. Uh, we now have, I believe, a $16 million budget today. 
Funding was very, very small, as you might expect, uh, in uh, the early days of the Library Commission. The state had suffered very badly from the Great Depression economically. So at around 1900, you only had one public library in the entire state. That was in Wheeling. It was at the Ohio County Public Library. Uh, then the first big, big initiative was Andrew Carnegie and his grants, which built libraries in several places around the state. And then later on, in the 50s, the Library Services Act. And that was the first big federal push for library development that occurred in the state. And then it, the sister of that became the Library Services and Construction Act, LSCA. And a lot of buildings were built with that money. Then later, in the late 60s and 70s, we have the Appalachian Regional Commission, which, which pumped about $2.5 million into library development in the state. And so really, we did not find that Every county had a public library until 1970s. And it was Gilmer County, the last county to have a public library, when an instant library was created in, that, in the town of Glenville. What was the role of bookmobiles during this construction era? Bookmobiles were critical because for a lot of places that didn't have an extant building, didn't have, and a lot of these women's club libraries met in rooms above stores and in civic fraternity buildings, you know, odd fellow halls, that sort of thing. But service then was provided by the bookmobile. So very, very early, you had what were called demonstration projects with bookmobiles where they were sent around to these communities. Ohio County, again, was the first bookmobile in the state in the mid-1930s. Uh, and and the, the, ultimately, the commission, clear through the 1960s and early 1970s, was still fulfilling service to the state through bookmobiles. But they were big bookmobiles. They were for about six or eight counties, they had what they called the Flying Book Express, and they were tractor trailers. And you can imagine driving tractor trailers on the rural roads in West Virginia, how, how difficult and demanding that must have been. I, you mentioned it already, that period where you saw the big growth in the number of library buildings across the state. What role did the commission play in all that? The commission was, was critical because it was the uh, library commission that, that created the instant libraries and later the outpost libraries, which put these smaller structural buildings into communities. And we had a governor. We had Arch Moore, who was governor, who was savvy about federal funding and how to get that money. And I know Ohio County and a lot of other uh, counties used that money when they improved their facilities. But for some of the smaller towns in West Virginia, it was the first library, the instant library, was the first library that ever was placed in their county as an extant building. And they were unique little buildings that were created for the library community. They were easily recognized in their communities. And they provided service that hadn't been there before. You know, as, as you look back at the history of the WVLC, how would you gauge the importance of the Library Commission in what we've seen is really some remarkable growth uh, in, in libraries across the state? Without the Library Commission, I think there would be no doubt that there would be communities that ha would not have library service in the state. Uh, they've always been in the forefront of providing that service, then creating buildings, and now today even providing internet connections throughout the state in communities that would not be able to afford those connections. So the Library Commission has been crucial in providing much needed and adequate and excellent service to the citizens of the state. Dr. Julian, we appreciate the time. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll have more on the WVLC on Libraries Today after this. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. This is a serious problem, but one we can solve. Visit feedingamerica.org to help. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're feeding America. The WVLC distributes all federal and state funds to public libraries, maintains the statewide library network, and provides other services to 171 libraries in the state. It's a big job. And with me now to discuss how it all works is Library Commission Chairman Betty Gano. Betty, thanks for being with us. My pleasure, Stan. We are here in the Commission Chambers, actually, here at the Culture Center in Charleston, West Virginia, where uh, you and the rest of the Commission do most of your, your work. Right. So tell me about the role of the Library Commission in the life of a public library in this state. 
Well, as you did in your intro, uh, they do oversee 171 public libraries in the state of West Virginia. Uh, it goes for everything from administrative, which would be support for uh, the directors of the libraries, the library boards of trustees, if they have any questions, uh, the library commission is here to offer assistance. Uh, they do assistance with children's summer reading programs. They do uh, uh, technical services support. They do special uh, services for the blind and physically handicapped. Uh, they do technical services through the uh, library's uh, network of library computers around the state, which is very good. So, I mean, they just do everything uh, for public libraries in the state of West Virginia. They oversee everything. How does one become a library commissioner? Ah, well, we are a nine-member board, and we are appointed by the governor. There are three members from each of the three congressional districts. That's right. So we have three districts, three members from each one. Yes. And there's your nine. Yes. I can do math. <laughs> so uh, what's your role as a chairman? What are, the, what are your duties? Well, technically, I, of course, run the meetings. Uh, I offer Karen support in anything that uh, she needs. If we need to do any uh, visits to libraries or to uh, talk to legislators or uh, Whatever Karen needs, I'm there to offer her support. I would say the typical commissioner uh, has a library background, uh, but not necessarily. Right. So tell me about, about your background and how you became a commissioner. Well, I worked at the Martinsburg Public Library for 41 years, and I retired in 2007. And in 2008 or whatever, there was a uh, vacancy on the board. And uh, uh, Mr. Manchin was governor at the time, and he had an administrative assistant named Mary Jo Brown from Martinsburg. And he asked Mary Jo if she had any suggestions of someone who could uh, be appointed to the library commission. And Mary Jo and I have known each other all our lives. <laughs> and so she mentioned my name, and uh, Governor Manchin uh, very graciously appointed me to the library commission. It's good to know somebody. I guess. <laughs> You know, libraries have changed uh, quite a bit. We had a previous segment talking with Chuck Julian and uh, how libraries have changed over the years. And, you know, when you look at it, you spent 41 years in a library yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, what were the kind of changes that you personally saw? Oh, good gracious. When I first started, we hand-checked out everything, you know, with the little stamp and the little library cards. And so, uh, you know, we did the uh, uh, computerization. Uh, we are doing more digital now. Um, the focus is um, shifted a little bit. I mean, we still, of course, do library books. We do library programming. Uh, we d had books on tape. Now you have the digital Kindles and everything. Um, it just, and libraries, I will say, have progressed as these new innovations come along. And um, now, of course, we're still providing reading. We still provide reference. Uh, and people think that if they see it on the internet, it must be true. <laughs> and librarians are there to guide you if you're doing uh, uh, any kind of research into the really good websites, the ones who give you the accurate information. I don't want to mention any others, but you know they, they kind of lead you to uh, where you can find correct information. So their, their focus has changed quite a bit. What do you see as the commission's biggest challenges? Money. <laughs> Truthfully, I mean, um, supporting the libraries, uh, uh, getting them to have financial support. Uh, in this fiscal situation right now, it seems like every year the library commission is taking cuts in their budget, and yet they are still uh, required to do the same amount of work with less people, less money. So I think that's a big a big problem. That's probably one of their biggest ones. How do you see libraries evolving down the road? Um, I think probably it's going to stay the way it is now for a while. Um, I don't, of course this is my own personal opinion, I don't ever see us getting rid of printed material. Uh, I personally have never used a Kindle. <laughs> I still I like, like to hold something I in like my holding yeah. my book. I like turning the pages. I like putting <laughs> my bookmark in there. And so, um, uh, but we are doing more and more digital, more and more computers, um, you know, with uh, things online. 
Uh, so we are, we are getting more into the computerization, but I think we'll probably also keep our roots for a while anyway. If you had a wish list for public libraries, what would be on that list? Dedicated funding for public libraries. Um, <clears throat> nationally, we rank sixth in state support, but we rank 47th in local support. And the, every year, the librarians go hat in hand to their governing bodies requesting money to operate for the coming year. And you just can't budget that way. And it would just be wonderful if we could have some sort of dedicated funding that said, this is what you are going to get. Now, there are a number of libraries in the state who have their, quote, special bills uh, that were passed years ago. Uh, Martinsburg, where I worked, was one of the fortunate ones. And even those have come under fire. So a dedicated funding for the public librarians is just top, top of it, as far as I'm concerned. What can the commission do to help make that happen? Well, we lobby every year to the legislature, and of course, one of the things that the legislators say, well, you know, we can look at it, but you need to give us an idea as to how to do this. Uh, they don't want to have to do all of the work. And so we have come up with a couple of different proposals over the years, and uh, nothing has ever flown. We're still working on it through the Library Association, which uh, can lobby the legislature. Um, and we will continue to work with that, but um, it's, it's a process and it takes a long time to do it. But I'm hoping that someday we will have a formula there that will give us dedicated funding so that all public libraries will know where their money's coming from. Betty, thanks so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. We'll have more on libraries today after this. Welcome to understood.org a free online resource for parents of kids with learning and attention issues with personalized recommendations, tools, and expert advice. Since 1945, the West Virginia Library Commission has had five executive secretaries. Dora Ruth Parks served for 26 years and was followed by Fred Glazier, who held the post from 1972 to 1996 until he was replaced by David Price. We are fortunate to have with us in the studio today the two most recent executive secretaries, J.D. Wagner, who served from 2001 to 2011, and the WVLC's current executive secretary and my boss, Karen Goff. Thanks to both of you for being here today. Sure. Thank you. So you both have served as executive secretary, obviously. Uh, tell me about the job. What does it entail? J.D.? <laughs> well, textbook, it's the advocacy role for public libraries in the state. Uh, it's actually much, much more than that. It's everything from being there for the smallest public library to being there for the largest public library system. It's a lot of training of library staff. It's, uh, um, but there's also a lot of outreach like through blind and physically handicapped, which is not normally a, a something you would think of when you think of the Library Commission. Uh, it's a, it's broad-based, always with information with libraries at the base. Karen, what do you feel is the most important aspect of the job? I thought about that, and I think it is similar to what J.D. said, defender of libraries, which sounds like we should have a <laughs> sword and a shield, but sometimes that is appropriate. And just realizing that each library is its own unique, has its own unique personality. And that personality is sort of based on the director, the board, the governing authority, the, the community. And realizing that those four things are probably not ever totally in alignment. It's part of the library commission's job to help facilitate, sometimes counsel, sometimes educate, sometimes cheerlead, and sometimes be the, the big stick. The one can say, the library commission says, we have to do it this way. And so it's a whole lot of different roles with that. And I know I'm sort of leaning on the regulatory things, but 
but the education part too of working with library staff, library trustees, and I think with government agencies and government officials, legislators that have a tendency to have a very narrow view of libraries and to expand that view on the importance they bring to the communities, to the state. J.D., you joined the commission as executive secretary in 2001, but you were here a lot longer prior to that. I began as a uh, part-time college student in 1968. Doing what? I drove the mail truck. <laughs> it was a great job, uh, especially for a college student because I had access to the reference library. <laughs> and uh, um, it was easy to put papers together when you made your stop at the, at the reference library each afternoon. Um, but it was, um, after I graduated from college, the um, commission said, we have an opening in the reference library if you're interested. And um, I thought, well, I have a history degree. What am I going to do? So um, I took the job in the reference library and um, discovered a calling. Uh, truly, I thought I'll be here a couple of years till I figure out what I'm doing. <laughs> Forty-three years later, I retired. <laughs> <laughs> But well, I, I think that's the nature of this agency. Um, we do good work with good people. The libraries in this state are a phenomenal group of people. And backtracking a little bit, I think a part of this agency's role in particular is to get to government to say, your smartphone has not taken the place of the library. Um, I heard that within... Um, within the last month from a member of a board of education. And it's a, it's a terrifying comment because we lose far, far too much. Um, in that 43 years, uh, we seem to tell that message over and over and over again. Because the other thing I saw in that 43 years was the changes in libraries. When I first started, we were rubber stamping locations inside books. <laughs> Uh, by the time I left, I told him if I had to learn one more word processor, I was gone. Uh, <laughs> computers had radically changed what goes on in libraries. You know, Karen, you've been around almost as long <laughs> almost. A, as J.D. And one of the things I thought was really interesting about the commission's role and what they've been able to accomplish over the years is in the 70s and 80s, the number of libraries in the state went through the roof. Mm -hmm. I mean, Close to half of the 171 libraries in the state were founded in the uh, 70s and 80s. After J.D. and I came and, 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 and were here at the commission. We, you sparked the resurgence. Absolutely. Actually, federal, federal money sparked that, that building boom, um, which I would certainly like to see another one soon. And a lot like J.D., I, I sort of fell into librarianship. I got my undergraduate degree in sociology, which J.D. had to remind me every once in a while that this was not a social work agency. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And um, didn't know what to do with that degree. And I was working in the library at the University of Pittsburgh. And some kind librarian said, well, why don't you go to library school? Said, okay, it sort of delayed <laughs> things. And then when I, after I got my degree, they said, you know, we don't have any professional positions, sort of same thing. Um, you need to find a job, <laughs> you know. And one of the librarians said, well, the West Virginia Library Commission is looking for a reference librarian. I had no idea what the West Virginia Library Commission was, what a state library was. But I came and again said I'd be here for two or three years. And here I am 46 years later, still here. <laughs> and it's been different all the time. There's always been something new going on. J.D., what stands out in your mind most when you look back on your years uh, at the commission? <laughs> wow. It's probably a diff really difficult question. The building period was probably somewhere between the building period and the technology would have to be the big cornerstones. Previous to the building in the 70s and 80s, we were running 18-wheelers into the coal fields as bookmobile. There were the Flying Book Express and the Read-A-Rama, and they would, they would make these stops in communities. And, and um, 
the planets kind of aligned with the coming of the federal funds, <laughs> definitely the appearance of Frederick Glazer, who saw the need for a fixed facility in a community. Um, from Welch to War is 12 miles. If you tell people out of state it's 12 miles, they think, well, how far is that? It's 128 curves and two mountains. And if you're doing that in an 18-wheeler one day a month, then you're really not reaching them. But if you put the fixed facility in the community, our public libraries serve as not just children's libraries, which is too often the conception. Mm -hmm. They are also, the for many of our small businesses, they are the corporate library. Uh, for a lot of West Virginia, they are the computer access, um, the only broadband access in many of these communities. Uh, now, there are still needs there, <laughs> but um, they serve a role that reflects the community. Karen talked about the libraries. Each one of them is different, and they have a tendency to reflect the community they're sitting in. Um, whatever the needs of the community are, that library fills those needs. Um, it, was, it was always, the state is very regional. There's like five really different regions of this state. The coal fields are very different from the eastern panhandle, the mountain part of the state, very different from the northern panhandle. And then the Charleston-Huntington corridor is, is completely different from everything else. But um, the libraries look at their communities and then reflect the need in that community. And I think that's probably the most satisfying part of this job was to get out of this building and get on the road, to get into the libraries, to meet with the library boards, to meet with library staff, um, to see what they were doing because each one was filling a different role and not something that we could see sitting here if you didn't get out and actually visit the locations. J.D., Karen, thanks for the look back. Uh, glad to do it. It's a pleasure to, to sit here and talk about it. <laughs> we'll be back with more on Libraries Today after this. Every child is curious. George, look what I found. Turn their curiosity into a lifelong love of learning. Create a curious reader. This is super bedtime reading. Share a book together today. Visit read.gov. When the West Virginia Library Commission was created nearly 90 years ago, there were only a handful of public libraries in the state. The vast majority of West Virginia counties had no public library at all. Slowly but surely, that began to change when the Library Commission was finally funded in the mid-1940s, and the real work of the commission got underway. Since those days, over 140 public libraries have been created in West Virginia, and every county in the state now hosts at least one public library. I'd like to thank my guests for being on today's show. Library Commission Chairman Betty Gano, Commissioner Dr. Charles Julian, former Commission Executive Secretary J.D. Wagner, and current Executive Secretary Karen Goff. I'm Stan Howe. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Libraries Today.